Hi everyone, hope you're doing okay. Just a couple of quick reminders that on Tuesday week on the 18th is our prayer and communion session again on Zoom and uh, we've got Ruth Gracie joining us this time. So uh, do make plans to be there. If you're not sure about Zoom, you're not sure how to get involved, then let us know. You can even dial in using just a normal landline if you haven't got the internet. And then the following Sunday, 23rd is Pentecost. And again, we've rented the school, St. John's School for that occasion. And Emma's going to be traveling across again to uh, lead that service with you. So just pray for her. Pray for Emma whenever you think of her. Pray as she finishes her dissertation shortly. And then the following Tuesday, 25th, is our Auction of Promises. Uh, do check out the website if you haven't done already. There's loads of great auctions on there to be won days out and uh, some great items um, that have been donated. And um, then you can either bid in advance on the website or you can come prepared for the live auction on the 25th, again on Zoom. So we come to part five of these seven letters in the churches to the churches in Revelation. And today, the letter to the church at Sardis. Sardis was a, a bustling trade city. The first modern money was minted in Sardis. It was also a city of culture. Aesop from Aesop's fables was from Sardis. And it was an impressive city to visit. Actually, the citadel itself was 1,500 feet up a mountain. And, and it kind of looked down on the, the rest of the province. In fact, it was, a, it was a very proud city. And as we've seen with the other letters, the church reflected the culture. How does Jesus start the letter? I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Ouch. That's quite a thing for Jesus to say to a church. How had it got to this? Well, to understand the letter, you have to know a bit about the city, a bit about Sardis. Remember, it's 1,500 feet up a mountain, and, and there was a road leading up, and on the other three sides, there was a sheer drop. It was actually known in the ancient world as an impregnable city. If something was impossible, they used to say in those days, oh, that's like taking the Acropolis at Sardis. If you've ever bought anything online and tried to return it, it's like taking the Acropolis at Sardis. A bit like the Titanic was known as the unsinkable ship. You've got to be careful what you call things. You're just asking for trouble. Because Sardis was so secure and impregnable, the problem was they took their security for granted and they became complacent. Pride cometh before a fall, says the Proverbs. And in 547 BC, Croesus, the king of Persia, sorry, Croesus, the king of Sardis, led an army against Cyrus, the king of Persia. And Cyrus, Sardis had a much smaller army. They were, they were arrogant to even in, to attempt it. And they ended up having to retreat, ran back up the little path up to their city. Phew, safe, or so they thought. Later that day, a Persian city, a Persian soldier, looking up one of the sheer cliff faces of Sardis, noticed a Sardinian soldier drop his helmet and climb down to achieve it. And the Persian soldier realised there must be a path up there somewhere. And that night, a small group of elite soldiers found the crack in the rock, climbed up the cliff face and found it completely unguarded. And they took the city. The point of Jesus' letter is that what had happened to the city in their history is what had happened to the church. Sardis was a city that failed to watch. They'd grown secure and comfortable and complacent and like the city had become vulnerable to the enemy. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give the devil a foothold. And the Persian army with just one foothold, just one crack in the rock, had taken down the entire city. It's what happens in churches, just a foothold for the enemy. It's what happens with our Christian lives. Just allow the enemy a foothold and things start to crack. As Jesus had told his disciples in Matthew 26.41, Watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation, so that you won't allow a, a little crack in your armour for the devil to get in. You see, this letter makes no mention of false teachers. There's no Nicolaitans, there's no Jezebel this time. There's no persecution, and there's the key. 
They were no longer a target for the devil because they were spiritually dead. It's when you're not being persecuted that you want to worry. And the church, like the city, had relied on its good name, on its reputation. They had been a strong church. But the thing about spiritual life is that it has to be renewed every morning. You can't rely on your faith from the past or an experience you had years ago. Sardis had a good name. No doubt they had the best preachers and the, the best musicians, but it was all just routine. They'd lost the life at the centre, lost the sense of being hungry for God, for seeking the new things of God, of seeking him in prayer, of being filled, going on being filled with the Holy Spirit and allowing it to overflow to the world. They'd lost God's heartbeat at the centre. As God had said through Isaiah in 29, 13, these people come near to me with their mouth. They honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Ouch. Or as Jesus himself says in that most haunting verse, Matthew 7, 21, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform miracles? And I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. I wonder how big the difference is between our reputation and our reality, between what others see and what God sees. I wonder which reputation we spend the most time nurturing. You know, 1 Samuel 16, 7, when God chose the, the little shepherd boy to be the king. And what does he say? The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. And what's Jesus' advice to those who lost their spiritual life? Verse 2, wake up. Strengthen what's about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in my sight. Remember what you have received. Hold fast and repent. So he gives four simple instructions to remedy the situation. Wake up. Strengthen what's about to die. Remember and repent. Firstly, wake up. Sometimes in life it feels like we're just going on autopilot. There's no surprises, no challenges, just mundane reality. But we've fallen asleep spiritually. Jesus says, wake up. In other words, there's always hope. There's always more grace. I heard a story about a, a building that was on fire. And someone said they only had one bucket of water in the back of their van. And as they drove past the whole of the fire brigade were just asleep on the front lawn in the sun. So they had a choice. Do they throw the bucket of water over the building and not do much? No, they threw the bucket of water over the firemen so that they woke up. And sometimes Jesus throws a bucket of water over the church so that we'll wake up and start to live for him. Secondly, strengthen what's about to die. In ministry, you know, I never really focus too much on church growth. There's a whole church growth movement, thousands of books on church growth. I prefer to focus on church health because something that's healthy will grow automatically. A gardener's concern is not primarily for how tall the plants grow, but if they're healthy, because something healthy will grow on its own. A parent's primary focus is, is not how tall the children are growing, because they know that if, it, if the child is healthy, then it will grow without thinking. So if a church isn't growing, then there's a problem with its health. Either it's dead and needs to be buried, and sometimes that does happen, or it's sick and needs some help, needs some medicine. Or there may be growth restricting factors. So if you've got 100 seats and you've got 120 people want to come, there's a growth restricting factor. You need to make a change. And it's the same with our own spiritual lives. If they're healthy, they should be growing. We should be growing. We should see a strength, a spiritual strength more than we had last year. If we're growing in Christ, if we're following him each day. If not, then... Either we're dead spiritually and there was no true faith there in the first place, just outward observance. And we need to just come to God and ask him to save us. Or we might be sick, spiritually sick, and lost our, our hunger for God. Or there may be growth restricting factors. Something hindering our growth as a Christian, like a weed in the garden. Maybe things from the past that 
need to be dealt with, but we're resisting. So wake up, strengthen what remains. Thirdly, remember. We need this in our marriages to remember while we first fell in love. Remember when you used to walk hand in hand in the beach. Remember when you, you used to ring each other up in your lunch break just to say, I love you. Remember that life needs to be rekindled. You can't take it for granted. Because with our marriages, with our relationships, with God, you're going in one direction or the other. You can't tread water. You're either growing closer or you're growing apart. God says, remember. Do you remember when you were most committed to God? When you said, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything for you, God. When you're at your most passionate. There's no reason why you can't have that sort of relationship again. Because faith is a gift. It's not something we have to muster up. It's something we have to be willing to receive. And he's waiting to fill us again. Do you want that? I'm not sure I do sometimes because it means being out of control, giving over control of our lives to God. And that's a bit scary. But just imagine if Christianity wasn't our part time hobby, but dominated every part of our life, dictated our decisions and our actions and how we spoke to each other and how we lived. Transformed our lives. That's what Jesus wanted for the Christians at Sardis to remember when they first come to him and, and left family and, and, and given everything for him before they slowly got comfortable and died on the inside. But just remembering is not enough. Verse 3, remember and what? Repent. You see, the biggest growth restricting factor in a church or in a Christian's life is sin. People come to me and they say, oh, oh I just seem to have lost my faith. I, I'm not sure if I believe anymore. You know, the biggest cause of doubt is also sin and people don't realise. Somehow we've turned our back on God and I, I say to people, well, no wonder you can't see God anymore. You've turned your back on him. Repent. Give him full control of your life. Hand over that issue, that sin that so easily entangles you. Keep going back to get help. Surrender it. And you'll be looking at God again. It will be a lot easier to believe. The remedy is so simple. Repent and believe. It's been the formula for eternal life for 2,000 years. And yet, and yet, if those at Sardis didn't heed the warning, verse 3, but if you don't wake up, I'll come like a thief and you'll not know the time I come to you. Like the Persian army scaling the wall, Jesus will come like a burglar. In other words, unannounced. The message, be ready, be prepared. So the question is this, if you knew that Jesus was coming back in a year from now, how would that change the way you live the rest of 2021? How would your priorities change? What about if you knew that Jesus was coming back in a month from now? It could be tonight. For most at Sardis, this was a harsh wake-up call, but for a few who had stayed faithful, verse 4, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. And we discover that, yes, the problem indeed was sin. Why they lost their spiritual hunger? They'd soiled their clothes. They defiled themselves. You know, I've said so many times, and believe me, it applies just to me as well to me as to you, that sin will take you further than you want to go. It will teach you more than you want to know. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. Believe me, that's true. But to those who had remained faithful, as in all the letters, he gives a wonderful promise. Verse 4, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will be dressed in white. In the Roman world, when a, a victorious army came home from war, Everyone wore white to share in their victory. Jesus says you're going to share in my victory. If you strive for your own victory, then you'll end up frustrated. But I'm inviting you to share in my glorious victory. White is a, a sort of theme in Revelation. There's the white stone, the white cloud, the white horse and the white throne. It's a sign of purity, holiness, being clean before God through Christ. Revelation 7:14. wash your robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
Jesus is painting a striking contrast between those who saw those clothes and those wearing white. The devil would have you believe that you haven't got the strength to walk in holiness, to resist sin, and, and he's right. But in God's power, in God's strength, clothed in God's army, daily submitting to him, victory is possible. Neil Anderson, the American writer, put it like this. I want you to know that you are, are a warrior of the Lord God Almighty. The battle for purity lies before you and your victory is yours for the taking in Christ. God is with you and make no mistake. You stand together as a formidable duo. I'm going to come into land, but the final promise, verse 5, to those who are clothed in white, those who are victorious, I will never blot out his name from the book of life but would acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Sardis had a reputation for being alive, but only in man's book. The entry for Sardis in God's book was very small. But to the faithful, he says, I won't cross out your name. Roman governors used to have a book of Roman citizens. And if someone died or if someone committed a particular crime, their name would be crossed out of the book. Jesus says, no, 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 not your sin. Not even death can remove you from my book. As God says in Isaiah 49, 16, see, I have engraved you in the palm of my hands. Because it's not about how good we are at being a Christian, but about how God he, how good he is at being a saviour. Maybe if we feel weak, perhaps like we're almost dying, spiritually, emotionally, maybe even physically. Jesus would come and say, wake up strengthen what remains remember and repent and i will make a way for you as he says through isaiah like streams in the wasteland and rivers in the desert or as jesus puts it in matthew 11 come to me come to me you've gone to so many other places come to me if you're weary and burdened if you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your soul. Rest for your soul. It's the sort of rest that a two-week holiday can't fix. Anyone need rest for their soul? Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember and repent. As that beautiful song says by Don Moen, who I think is the favourite songwriter of John and Mandy, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. God will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me close and to his side. God will make a way. God will make a way. So I pray that God will bless you and keep you today, this week. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly on you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. See you next time.